IO9 presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here are your hosts, John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 48 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Hi, I'm John Joseph Adams. I'm the editor of Lightspeed and Fantasy Magazine. And I've also edited several anthologies, such as The Way of the Wizard, which features tales of wizardry and witchcraft from authors such as Neil Gaiman, George Martin, and our guest this week, Leb Grossman. And I'm David Barr Kirtley. I'm the author of many short stories, including Family Tree, about a family of feuding wizards who live in a giant magical treehouse. The story appeared in John's anthology, The Way of the Wizard, that he just mentioned. And uh, another contributor he mentioned, Lev Grossman, is our guest today. He's a book reviewer for Time Magazine, and is the author of the fantasy novels The Magicians and The Magician King, which take a skeptical look at the idea that going to a wizard school or traveling to a magical kingdom would be all wonder and adventure. Okay, so let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Lev Grossman. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Okay, so first of all, just tell us about your new book, The Magician King. What's it about? Right. My new book, The Magician King, is uh, a sequel to... um, uh, the Magicians, and it picks up where The Magicians left off, more or less. It's about uh, two people, principally. One is Quentin, who is a guy in his mid-twenties who uh, has learned to do magic and has found his way to Fillory, which is uh, a secret magical world that is not Narnia, hmm. um, and yet is not wholly unlike Narnia. And uh, unlike the Pevensies, who got who were always, who were always getting their asses kicked out of Narnia, Quentin and his friends have figured out how to stay, and so they're currently ruling Fillory um, as its kings and queens. And I figured I, I wanted to think about you know what that would really be like ruling your own little magical utopia, and I figured that the good times would probably last for about two years before you realize that there are no problems here, and I'm a figurehead. And uh, it's actually really boring and kind of unsatisfying. So Quentin, uh, at the beginning of the book, has been doing this for two years, and he starts to get restless. And then the other major figure in the book is named Julia. Julia was a minor character in The Magicians. She is Quentin's. She was Quentin's friend in high school. And when Quentin got admitted to a magical college called Breakbills, uh, she also took the entrance exam, but she flunked it. But she couldn't kind of let go of it. She knows that magic is real and she knows that she's not allowed to do it and it's going on around her all the time and she can't touch it and she sort of starts to go slowly crazy knowing that and the story, her story is the story of her obsession with magic and her determination to learn magic and how she does it and she does it outside the sort of safe walls of break bills and as a result lots of terrible things happen to her. So when did you decide that you wanted to write a sequel to The Magicians, and uh, how did you go about developing the idea? I didn't decide it. It must might have been better if it had worked differently. I did not decide it while I was writing The Magicians. Um, I only decided it, I think, really shortly before the book came out. Uh, I had written The Magicians as a one-off, and I started to think about how much stuff I hadn't been able to fit into it. And there were certain things that I was curious about um, in that world that hadn't been resolved. So... uh, I I began to kick around some some different ideas for how to continue the story. And one of them was just a little bit of a thought experiment having to do with um, the Pevensies and the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, I always hated it when the Pevensies got kicked out of Narnia. And I always was very curious about the time that they spent as kings and queens of Narnia, which you never get a good look at at all. Lewis is always cutting away from that. Um, and, you know, you hear about it for about a page towards the end of Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, before they um, uh, before they go back because they sort of, they're hunting and they stumble on this lamppost and they get sent back to England. So I wrote a scene which was a kind of, in a funny way, a kind of goof on the last chapter of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which was a scene where Quentin and his friends are out hunting and they're incredibly bored They and they come across this sort of magical wonder and and... Quentin sort of like, yeah, man, we've got to do this. We have to, this is an adventure. We've got to go on it, which is just what the Pevensies said when they saw the magic lamppost. And everybody else looks at him and says, 
are you fucking kidding me? We are kings and queens of fillery. You know, we get banquets and foot rubs and everything else every night. There's no <laughs> fucking way we're going on that uh, adventure and getting our asses killed or shipped back to Earth. And so they don't go on the adventure. They turn away from it. And then instead, adventure kind of comes looking for them. Uh, so what sort of feedback did you get on The Magicians? And did any of that influence uh, you writing the sequel? Yeah, it did. The Magicians was something that I wrote uh, for me in, in really quickly and really intensely. Um, it was a really a moment where I kind of, even though I'd written two novels before, it, it was the moment when I really found my voice as a fiction writer. I wrote it kind of unreflectively in a way. I mean, I labored over it and revised it a whole lot, but it was just, it was really raw. Uh, and so I didn't, I hadn't really thought very much to be honest about what people would feel like reading it. Um, I, I wanted them to like it and I wanted them to be entertained by it, but I had trouble getting sort of distance on it. Um, and then it came out and then I got distance on it. Um, I, well, first of all, I got a lot of encouragement, which I'd never really had as a writer before. But then, you know, I, th I think the main thing was um, watching the way people reacted to Quentin, the main character. I had never really thought about, well, are people going to like Quentin? Are they not going to like Quentin? All I thought about was, let's try to do a really realistic portrait of uh, a serious uh, and seriously depressed fanboy that I was when I was 17. Uh, for a lot of people, they experienced Quentin the way I hoped they would. Uh, but a lot of people didn't like him. A lot of people thought he was a pain in the ass, which it's embarrassing now to say that I didn't see it coming. That was very interesting to me. I learned a lot from that and uh, hopefully fed it back into Quentin 2.0. In the magician thing. I mean, what do you think about that issue of whether a book needs likable protagonists or not? Um, I think it's 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 a really important um, it's a really important thing. I'm I'm very into you know novels as entertainment. Their responsibility above their responsibility to the, to psychological truth or the truth of, the, of 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 life or the world is, is 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 their function as entertainment. So you have to want to spend four hundred pages hanging out with the people in it. And you know, furthermore, you know, if a character is unlikable, you know, it's the novelist not doing his job. I mean, there's plenty of, of characters you know out there in fiction who you would cross the street to avoid, but you really it just it's really pleasant to be in their heads because. They're just so human and so well understood by their authors. Um, so I almost feel like if a character is unlikable, you know, it really has to do a lot with with how they're written. And maybe they're not written well enough. You know, I adore reading about Humbert Humbert, you know, who's somebody who I cheerfully murder uh, if I ever met him. So I, I think there's no there's no real excuse for uh, a character, certainly a point of view character, to be unlikable. Okay, so you know, Laura Miller wrote a book called The Magician's Book about her conflicted feelings toward the Christian subtext of Narnia. Uh, do you have a similar sort of conflicted feelings toward Narnia, and did her book influence you at all? I love that book. Uh, I read it, and I know Laura. And I was, uh, I was pissed at her when she, her <laughs> book came out because she took, for its website, she took the, the domain magiciansbook.com. <laughs> I wanted that domain, so I had to take The Magician's Book dot com which kind of would be more appropriate for her book it never really resolved that um i re i read that i read laura's book really closely and it influenced me a lot in writing the magicians uh but that you know that said i never had that kind of i don't have the right antibodies um in my brain to react badly to the religious subtext of of the narnia books it doesn't bother me probably because i grew up with as little religion as it's kind of possible to grow up with in America. My family was not a religious household, and I just thought religion was weird, kind of interesting. Uh, and some people are into it, and some people aren't. Um, so it, it, it never really bothered me. It was never really an issue. But I certainly learned uh, a lot about just, you know, the context for Narnia and, and how to become a better Narnia reader from that book and the sort of strange interplay between Tolkien and Lewis. It's a great book. Philip Pullman's uh, His Dark Materials trilogy is, is often seen like uh, like the magicians a, as a response to Narnia. Uh, what similarities or differences do you see between your approach and his? They were immensely important to me, those books, which I read in the late 90s, I think. I'm going to get it wrong. I think the late 90s, when I was kind of fulminating 
sort of pre-fulminating the magicians. Uh, and first of all, they were really liberating. It never occurred to me that, it never would have occurred to me that you could kind of talk back to Lewis. Lewis is such an overwhelming figure for me. It was just sort of like, well, right. Those are the, the there are these great monuments, the Narnia books, and you have to work around them. But uh, Pullman, you know, said, fuck that. And he engaged with them directly in a way that was really powerful. And uh, I just thought, I just didn't know you could do that. And then I watched him do it and thought, you know, yeah, that's, I need to have that conversation too with Lewis. Um, so they were hugely influential for me, really important. I actually met Pullman once and I talked to him about Lewis. And he's way more pissed at Lewis than <laughs> I am. But uh, uh, that was just like, you know, it got me fired up and just interested in Lewis and, and, and not just loving Lewis, but responding to Lewis and being a little bit annoyed at him. Uh, so stories like this that propose a secret subculture of magic users often seem to raise the issue of uh, how all this stuff could possibly be kept secret. Uh, is that something you worried about while while writing the book? Uh, it's on a major focus. It's on this major focus, uh, for example, as it is in, in the Harry Potter books. Uh, Harry Potter has this thing, and I love Harry Potter. I'm a huge fan of it. But I always felt that there was a little bit of a double consciousness there because the um, the wizards in Harry Potter are always... You know, they're really always bending over backwards to say how much they love the muggles. Muggles are great. Muggles are every bit as good as, as magicians. But then, you know, you realize if, if you ask them, well, would you ever want to be a muggle? They would be like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> That's just degraded. Um, so, you know, there's some weird, I feel like there's some weird unstated snobbism in, in the, <laughs> the world, um, which I think is a little more stated in the magician's books. Um, and frankly, in the magician's books, the... Um, Magicians, I think, are a little bit better at policing themselves and each other because they're conscious that they have a really good thing going on here. And, you know, they don't want, uh, uh, they, they don't want to cut anybody else in on the game. Um, so, you know, they just um, they keep their shit to themselves. So during your Campbell Award acceptance speech, you said that writing fantasy is what you want to be doing with your life, but it took you a long time to realize that. Uh, why do you think it took so long? And what other sorts of things did you try out first? I did come to fantasy, to writing fantasy, really late. Um, I didn't start The Magicians till I was 35. And I think it's partly because of the, the sort of slightly, slightly unusual circumstances of my upbringing, which is that I was brought up by two English professors. My parents are both PhDs in English and um, taught. My dad taught at Brandeis and Johns Hopkins. My mom taught at Smith and UC Irvine. Um, so they were real sort of like people of letters and very much um, uh, uh, guardians of the canon and, you know, heirs to, uh, to me, a somewhat rigid, you know, sense of, of, of what literature is and what literature is definitely not. So uh, I, while I always read fantasy and never stopped and science fiction, comic books and all that stuff, I think it, it was a little bit hard for me to embrace my uh, kind of voice as a fantasist just because I had, I, I, was, I was kind of always taught to feel a bit ashamed of being that into the stuff which, you know, they did not consider to be literature. It's it's funny to say it out loud, but writing fantasy was a, an act of extreme kind of Oedipal rebellion for me um, against my parents, uh, which, you know, given that I was 35, was kind of long overdue. <laughs> but just just takes some people a long time to say, screw you, mom and dad, I'm taking the car and I'm writing a <laughs> fantasy novel. And that's that's sort of what I what I went through. Um, I really had to get in touch with you know who I was, what I wanted out of life, and 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 what I wanted to say before I died. And when I really did that, then I wrote the magicians. But it took me a long time, longer than it should have, um, to uh, to do that. Okay, so uh, as book critic for Time Magazine, you've been a big proponent for fantasy, bringing attention to authors such as George R. R. Martin and Alan Moore. Uh, did you consciously see yourself as an advocate for fantasy at Time, and did you get any pushback from other people at the magazine who maybe don't care as much for fantasy? Um, I think that's a yes and a yes. That's a <laughs> double yes. But uh, I felt like there needed to be a rebalancing. The number of people and the amount of time they spent reading fantasy and science fiction and other, and other genre stuff was not represented by in, in the reviews that were appearing in the pages of Time. So, you know, in, uh, I think it was 2005, I wrote this piece about Martin, you know, who was, you know, he's gone to another level now. Even then, he was insanely popular, but you just didn't read about him in the mainstream at all. So, you know, I had to, uh, I felt like, you know, 
I just I had to put up my hand and say, this is what's going on. And no one's acknowledging it. And it's me, I guess it's, it's sort of a small thing, but it's a big thing. It's a big thing to me. And I feel really happy that, you know, I'll look at some people's books and, you know, they'll say who I really admire, like Kelly Links. Um, they'll have a quote on them saying, you know, this book is awesome. Time magazine. <laughs> and I'll think, yeah, you know, that's good. Time is enormously powerful and it's a very blunt instrument, but you can still kind of lay about you with it and, um, you know, make little changes here and there. And, uh, and I've I've really tried to do that. Uh, so you wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal called uh, "Good Books Don't Have to Be Hard." Uh, that got a lot of criticism. Um, why do you think that piece struck a, such a nerve? And uh, what were some of the more extreme reactions to it? Um, I don't know. That's been a big mystery to this day uh, to me because you know I've continued saying the same things in that article since it came out, and they have gradually grown less and less controversial uh, and more and more generally agreed with. Um, I think that they, the response to it partly came because it felt high-handed, uh, which I can see. You know, nobody knew who I was, uh, and it was appearing in the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, which is an extremely mainstream corporate publication. And I felt like, I think there was some feeling of who is this asshole <laughs> who's coming out of nowhere and commenting on our uh, our, our genre and our, our culture, even though he is praising it to the skies, I would like him to fuck off now. <laughs> um, I think there was some of that, which, you know, I can completely see, um, because who is this asshole? I don't know. You know. It's just me, but, you know, no one had any reason to take me seriously. Yeah, I don't know. And then I think I felt like there was people, I was writing basically, you know, in, 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 in saying that uh, the tradition of textually challenging, interpretively challenging, narratively static um, fiction that we inherited from the modernists is now sort of passing away. Um, and there are people who write really good, textually challenging, narratively static uh, fiction who felt that in addition to praising the stuff I was praising, I was implicitly criticizing them. And again, I can see that. I would reiterate that, you know, um, it feels, a, it feel, I, th I think the things in that article, my sense is that they are a lot less controversial than they seemed at the time. So you also wrote an article called My Mortal Enemy about discovering that a random stranger online named Ed Champion dislikes you. Uh, what was it like writing that piece? And have there been any further developments in your relationship with Ed Champion? God, I just realizing that having worked for time for 10 years, I've written like a lot of shit. And I <laughs> that piece in years. Uh, oh, yeah, I was just I, at the time I was just really frustrated by um, this blogger, Ed Champion, who's still around and still blogging. Uh, because he has a very rebarbative rebar style, and um, I don't, I didn't think that he was as aware as he might have been as how shouty uh, he was, um, and really a, a how much influence he wielded online. Um, you know, in terms of shaping my reputation, so I found it really frustrating, and I kind of was good to kind of get it off my chest. But uh, I don't think there have been any sequels. I've run into Ed uh, <laughs> a few times. He moved to New York after that, and. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen him a few times, um, but, uh, you know, we've had a few email interchanges, nothing, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make a great story. Nothing dramatic has happened. Hmm. Okay. So your short story end game appeared in John's anthology, the way of the wizard. Uh, hmm. what, what's that story about and how did you come up with the idea? That was the first short story I ever published. Um, now one of two short stories I've ever published. It began as the kind of opening act for the magician king. Um, that was how the book was originally going to open. Uh, there's a throwaway comment in The Magicians about a kind of subculture of wizards uh, who are gamers, who take part in this kind of real-world kind of scavenger hunt slash war game that is waged secretly uh, all around the world. And it's a game, but sometimes it gets a bit too real and people get killed. Uh, and it's basically a way for uh, magicians to stave off boredom because there is no sort of figure of like Sauron or the White Witch for them all to band together and fight. So it was thinking about that. It was a throwaway comment of the magicians, but I was really curious as to what that world was like. And so I wanted to write from the point of view of somebody who was in it. And, you know, the idea was uh, that at the end, Quentin would step in and um, say, you know, You've been playing this game long enough. Why don't you try something real and take her to Fillory? In the end, I couldn't make that work with the 
mechanics of the plot quite, uh, although I also haven't given up uh, on incorporating elements of it in book three. Uh, okay, well, that that answers uh, partially our next question. We were going to say, is, are, are there any more novels or stories set in the universe of the magicians? Uh, so I guess you're you're already working on book three? Yeah, well, there's at least two things that are going to happen. One of them is an anthology piece um, for uh, um, that something that, that George R. R. Martin and uh, Gardner Dozois are, are putting together about fantasy with women heroes. Um, and uh, one thing I wanted to do, in The Magician King... You know, one of the principal characters from The Magicians, whose name is Janet, who is one of my favorites, doesn't get really anything to do. She's mostly off stage for the book, so I thought I would write something set in the same world and happening during that same time period, explaining what the hell Janet was doing while everybody else was off having adventures. So that is next. And then, yeah, I think there'll be a third Magician's novel, third and, and final Magician's novel, which will kind of complete the arc. Uh, is there any chance of a film adaptation of the magicians? Uh, of the magicians? Yes, there's definitely chances of it. And uh, you could infer from the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm not very free to discuss this topic that hmm. uh, there is, you know, knocking on wood, something pending, which hopefully we can announce uh, down the line. All right, great. And just then finally, are there any other new or upcoming projects that you'd like to mention? You know, there aren't a lot. Uh, just because I have, I, I have, I work a full-time job. I, I, I don't get to spin off as many, you know, side projects and things like that as I would like to. Although actually, it's a good cover for the fact that I don't have any other ideas right now. Mm -hmm. I have, I've got an idea that I'm really excited about for the third magician's book, um, and I'm raring to go after it. And there's still a lot of stuff to do promoting the Magician King, um, so I haven't been able to clear my schedule enough. Um, to like really sit down and just kind of just dive into it, um, which I always thought when novelists said that it was kind of bullshit, but it's completely true. I mean, having two kids, one of whom is is one and one of whom is seven, uh, and my wife is also working on a novel, um, it's literally impossible to put two hours next to each other and just, hmm. you know, have somebody who's not, you know, throwing up on you or doing something. <laughs> uh, uh, it's just, it can't be done and it will be done. Um, but probably not till I finished touring Canada in October. So I don't know, beginning of November, I hope, but I, I know a lot about what happens in the third book and I'm confident that it will go quick. All right. Well, Lev Grossman, thanks so much for joining us on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Thank you for having me. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Lev Grossman for joining us on the show. All right, and so for our discussion today, we're going to be uh, talking about A Dance with Dragons, book five in the Song of Ice and Fire series by George R. R. Martin. And uh, this is going to be lots of spoilers, so if you haven't uh, read Dance with Dragons, don't listen to this, and uh, you know, just go, go read those uh, five books uh, in the series and come, <laughs> come back and, and, and check out what we have to say. Um, we'll, be, we'll be here in three months waiting for you. <laughs> And, and we're joined today by a special guest geek, Doug Cohen. So, Doug, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. So, Doug uh, is an old friend of ours. He is a, uh, was the longtime slush reader and, edit and then later editor for Realms of Fantasy magazine and is an author with a few short story sales. I see, Doug, why don't you tell, tell the people, tell the listeners about your short story sales? Oh, uh, thanks, Dave. I've published in Interzone magazine and... October's been pretty kind to me because I just sold a story to Fantastic Stories, The Imagination, and also to Weird Tales. All right, well, awesome. And so I think I just want to start things off by just asking each of you, or have everybody go around and say, just how did you first discover A Song of Ice and Fire, and how many times have you read each of the books in the series? Okay, I discovered Song of Ice and Fire the old-fashioned way uh, back when the first book came out. I was browsing in the bookstore, and I said, hey, what's this? Took it down, said, okay, I'll give it a try. And it was a love affair from there, it, because it has become my favorite series. And I've read the first three books four times. I read the fourth book three times. And in anticipation hmm. of this discussion, I just finished rereading the latest book. 
Yeah, so uh, I, I discovered Game of Thrones. Uh, actually, I was I was at that I was at a bookstore event uh, to get Clifford the Big Red Dog to sign a book <laughs> for me, and uh, and I discovered this poor lonely man sitting all by himself in the bookstore. No, I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, no, uh, yeah, no, being friends with Dave and Doug um, and uh, some of our other friends in New York, uh, just uh, everybody was just talking about Song of Ice and Fire all the time, and it was just like I had sort of given up on epic fantasies because uh, I'd sort of burnt out on them by a- after having read a lot of them when I was younger um, and having, like, sort of lost steam on, on reading something like Wheel of Time. Um, um, but hearing everybody uh, hearing everybody talk about how great they were, I just uh, – I eventually gave in to peer pressure, and I, and, I, uh, and I finally read Game of Thrones, and that was, I don't know, probably around 2004 or 2005. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, I, I read the first book and I thought it was amazing. And then, uh, and then I went on to, uh, I went on to read the second book shortly later. But, uh, so I've read, I've read Game of Thrones and Clash of Kings twice. Um, and then I've only read the other books once each. Okay. And then I, uh, discovered Game of Thrones. Uh, I, I attended a writing workshop called Odyssey in 2001. And one of the other students there, this guy, Danny, told me I had to read Game of Thrones. And so later, you know, after the workshop that summer, I picked up Game of Thrones and read it and loved it and read Clash of Kings and Storm of Swords shortly thereafter, which were, you know, those three were the only ones that were out at the time. You know, I, I read those three books five times waiting for Feast for Crows to come out. And then I read Feast for Crows once. And then I sort of like started rereading it in preparation for Dance with Dragons. But I think I only made it about halfway through. And then I, and then I just read Dance with Dragons. Next question is, how would you guys rank the first four books? For me, I would put the third book at the top, but it's very close between the third book and the first book, because the first book introduces you to the world, the story, the characters. And, you know, I would say with most epic fantasies in particular, usually the first book is the strongest or one of the strongest. Uh, But... George kind of just keeps raising the stakes, and, like, the third book was just, it was just an apocalypse (laughs) of death and destruction and mayhem, and it it just blew my mind. So three, slightly behind that one, and then, you know, I almost feel bad putting, you know, the second book third, because the second book was great, but I'll put the second book third, and I enjoyed the fourth book, but of the four... It is number four. I, w- I would rank it very similarly, but I don't know. I'd be inclined to probably put the first book first, um, just because that that first book is so amazing and it has such a great ending. And uh, and because it is the first one, I I I I, I at least do give it more um, more credence in, in in ranking it. So I would uh, I would rank it one, three, two, and then four. Um, and I also enjoyed uh, Feast for Crows, um, although. Uh, I, I was very frustrated, even though I even though I knew I was. I mean, I actually only read it um, shortly before um, Dance with Dragons came out, and uh, even though I knew I was going to be able to find out what happened to the rest of the characters, you know, I uh, I was very frustrated by uh, you know not being able to read about what was happening with the with the char- with the other characters that were not in that book. Okay, yeah, and I, I agree certainly that Feast for Crows is the weakest of the four, and and Clash. Uh, Clash of Kings is is num- number three. I I would probably put Game of Thrones number one, but depending on my mood, I might go with Storm of Swords. Uh, I think Storm of Swords had like the highs are higher, but there's also more kind of like time where where not a lot is happening. Uh, whereas Game of Thrones, like every single chapter, like advances the plot and you know something cool is happening. So you know it's it's close for me between those two, but I would probably you know put Game of Thrones at number one. All right, so now uh, could you guys talk describe the circumstances of getting your hands on Dance with Dragons and you know, how fast you read it, what format you <laughs> read it, stuff like that? I read it in hardcover, and I basically put my life on hold <laughs> as much as I could. Uh, I sacrificed as much sleep as I could also, and I burned through that monster in like a week. Mm. And I kind of liken it to saying I gorged myself like a manderly at a feast. So, (laughs) you know, I'm glad that I read it a second time just because the first time, you know, I'm one of those fans that was waiting 11, 10 years to find out what happens to John, what happens to Tyrion. So the first time, yeah, it was great reading it, but there was a huge part of me that just wanted to know. Just give me the, the raw information. Give me the data so that I can just understand what has finally happened. And the second time when I read it, 
I was able to read it at a much more leisurely pace. So I actually enjoyed the book a lot more the second time around. I got it uh, as soon as it came out. I ordered, I you know, I pre-ordered it, the hardcover, and I got it from like Amazon or something. And uh, um, but uh, so I had it sitting there in my house. But um, I'd also just gotten an iPad recently, and uh, and I and I and actually. I actually had all of the books in either paperback or, or, or hardcover already, and uh, but when I went to go reread them, I actually um, I bought them all in ebook format because um, because I'm doing a lot of reading at the gym, and uh, you know like I do the elliptical and I read while I'm doing it, and uh, um, and you know reading on an iPad is a, a hell of a lot easier than reading you know a, a thousand page volume with fairly small print um, while you're trying to do exercise. So I mean I've been reading it that way. And then so uh, Dance with Dragons, I actually I do own in hardcover, but then I also bought the ebook and and I read it in the ebook. I I, didn't, I have I haven't actually cracked open the cover of the of the of the hardcover. But yeah, I mean, and so the as far as uh, how long it took me to read it, um, I unfortunately I, I didn't have as much free time to read uh, just for pleasure by the time that came out, and uh, so it took me quite a bit longer than I was hoping, and plus. Um, we sort of had a detour. I, I sort of had a detour in the middle of reading it um, because of Geek's Guide, because when we were doing episode 42, um, we were doing an episode focused on Douglas Adams. And so I wanted to reread the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books. Um, and so I sort of had to take a detour and read um, all of those because, uh, I mean, it had been so many years since I had read them. So uh, so I had sort of had to put Dance with Dragons on hold, which was very frustrating, and then, uh, you know, turn all of my attention to, to Hitchhiker's Guide. Um, and so I did, and then I returned to Dance with Dragons. Um, and then also there was some, I think um, I was still reading it when Worldcon happened and 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 I was planning a wedding and so um, <laughs> it wasn't quite ideal circumstances uh, to burn through the book as fast as I would have liked. But uh... okay, and then I let's see the book came out the day I was leaving for <laughs> to drive to uh, Pittsburgh for to teach at the Alpha Writing Workshop, which really bummed me out because otherwise I would have you know like Doug just sort of sequestered myself and and gone through the whole thing. But so I. So I set out driving that morning, and I happened to pass by a Borders, back when there were still Borders, uh, in uh, New Jersey, and I picked up a copy of the hardcover, but then I couldn't read it, you know, because I'm driving, and it's just sitting on the passenger seat <laughs> taunting me. But then I picked up one of our other staffers in Philadelphia, and she had read all the other books, so I told her to start reading that thing to, to me out loud. <laughs> so she read the she read it out loud, you know, the whole way between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, so that was, you know... We got through the first hundred pages or something. So the first hundred pages was just me listening to her read it. And then I read another maybe 200 pages. And then I t took a trip out to California for John's wedding in Worldcon. And I didn't think I was going to have any time to read it. And I didn't want to lug this gigantic hardcover around. So I didn't bring it. Uh, but then I really wanted to keep reading it. So then I actually bought the audiobook. <laughs> and then I listened to the audiobook for a couple of like four hours or something. And then when I got home, back home to New York, I finished reading the Hardcover, except, you know, I had to, like, like John, for Geek Scott, I had to read all these other books in the meantime. So uh, I actually just finished it, like, a week ago or something. Yeah, so I was actually in the rare position of uh, being ahead of Dave on, on the series, uh, you know, after I, I had been behind uh, all every, all of my friends for so long, and I had been living in this... Uh, this cocoon where I had to prevent myself from being spoiled on all these uh, things that were going to happen. And so finally I, I, I could free myself uh, of these shackles. I, I, I didn't need to worry about spoilers anymore. It was wonderful. Well, it was funny because John and I would be on the phone, you know, and be like, well, what part are you up to? And you're like, uh, well, the part where, well, wait, no, I don't want to spoil it for you if you're ahead of me. <laughs> um, you know, and it's like, it's actually kind of hard to uh, fix where you are respectively in the book without mm -hmm. spoiling, you know, potentially mm -hmm. spoiling anything. Yeah, it was frustrating because I was reading the ebook, and so I didn't know what page I was on per se compared to what page you were on. And then you were listening to the audiobook also, and so it was yeah, it was a it was a real pain. George Martin, would you number your chapters, please? <laughs> Seriously, I was a little frustrated just because I burned through it so fast that I had to wait for a while for my friends to read it so that I could actually discuss it with them. And, mm -hmm. You know, you can talk about it with the internet, and I did talk about it with the internet, but. These books you want to talk about with your friends face to face once you finally finish them. So that killed me for a while, just waiting for other people to finish, and I'd almost yell at them, "Come on, man! What are you waiting for? Why aren't you done with that yet?" Okay, yeah. So I mean, now that we've all read it, how would you guys rank this one compared to the other four? Uh, I thought it was a step up from Feast for Crows. You know, just well, I mean, first of all, it's longer, so there's you know a lot more going on. 
the stakes have been raised again, I think. Uh, more death and destruction and mayhem, which is all to the good. You know, I would put it right after Clash of Kings, but I was I was very happy with it overall. Yeah, I mean, I would probably put it after Clash of Kings as well, um, you know, but better than Feast for Crows. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I... I, I might be tempted to put it above Clash, for, Clash of Kings, but um, that's mainly, I mean, the, I think Clash of Kings might be a better, it, it might be a more accomplished book in terms of, um, like, sort of answer, you know, sort of raising the stakes and answering questions and stuff. But then in, in book five, there's a lot of satisfying um, resolutions to things that um, that have come up. Um, okay, and I, I agree. I would put it a little bit ahead of Feast for Crows. Um, so John, what, what were some of the things that were resolved in this book? Cause I, one of my big complaints was I didn't feel like much was, was resolved. Yeah. I mean, well, uh, I mean, I guess, I guess not really resolved fully like in a storytelling sense, but I mean, things were sort of brought to a head, I guess. Like, I mean, you know, there's, there's the thing with John at the end and, and I mean, we're just going to spoil this completely. Right. So, yeah, yeah. um, you know, like, I mean that, that actually like, like you know, so when John gets stabbed at the end, like I, I mean, I just, I, I, I got, I got really angry at that. But I mean, at least like that's okay. That that's was sort of one of the things I was talking about. Was like that was a major uh, move forward with that storyline, at least, right? Because like I mean, most of the book and most of his storyline had been very static uh, since. Well, I, I mean, I guess most of this book. I mean, because uh, nothing much, nothing much had changed from the start of this book into, until the end uh, from Storm of Swords. You know, because like uh, some stuff, a bunch of stuff happened in Storm of Swords, but then in this book, like not much had happened really up at the wall uh, to advance the plot. You know, I mean, maybe stuff has happened, but I, I mean, I don't know. I was hoping for more, I guess, but um, I'm sure Doug's going to yell at me here in a minute. <laughs> but um, I mean, I, I read some interesting theories about like about this scene um, online and, and they make a lot of sense, but I mean, uh, I, I think that it really angered me when that happened, but I mean, I don't, I don't think that John could actually be dead. I mean, it's, it's just, it's like impossible just cause like he's too important to the story and it's like, you know, yeah, I know Martin kill will kill anyone, but. Well, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think it's true that Martin will kill anyone. I mean, I think, I think basically, you know, John, Daenerys, Arya, Tyrion are like safe at this point. I mean, it was just, it was just so, you know, it was just, you know, like like when Tyrion falls in the river. I mean, I didn't think for a second he was dead. I mean, you know, it never even cr- crossed my mind. Um, and the same th- same with John too. I'm like, okay, there's no way he's dead. I mean, he's you know, I mean, maybe he's dead corporeally or something. But I mean, the character is coming back, so you know, <laughs> somehow. Uh... My theory, at least, I think Jon Snow, as we know him, that character is dead because I think Jon Snow is Azor Ahai or however you say it. As are Ahai reborn, uh, because we get a number of clues. Uh, there's one point where Melisandre is trying to find Stannis, but she says at one point, I keep asking my lord, in reference to the Lord of Light, to show me Azor Ahai, and all I see is snow. Mm. And snow is capitalized uh, for Jon Snow. So... I do think he's Azor High Reborn. John's also the 998th commander uh, at the Wall. I don't think that number is a coincidence because someone's probably going to step up now with John dead and he will not be alive long. And then you could get to the thousandth commander of the Wall who will probably be John returned as Azor Ahai. Mm. I was thinking that um, that it makes sense... Uh... Like, you know, once you once you get over the shock of of John being stabbed, which actually I think the reason that it pissed me off is that it seems so senseless the way he like that happened. I'm like, what the what the fuck? Like, what the, what are they doing? This is crazy. Um, but uh, but I mean, I think like he kind of has to die because he that he has to be released from his vows uh, with the watch because that because they you know they uh they they serve until death, right? So um, in order for him to be freed of that, so that some other things can happen in the plot, like he had to be killed. But, you know, I think he's going to be back in some sense, like whether it's what you're saying or, or something else. I mean, what you're saying makes sense. But I, I am a little uh, sort of concerned that, you know, a lot of a lot of people now are sort of been, you know, dead, but not really dead, you know, in the series now, you know, because I mean, there's there's Catelyn and, and, and you know, there's Dondarrion and, and you know, it's like, well, Dondarrion, though, is dead now again. Right, I know, but I mean, you know what I mean. It's yeah, like, he came you know, back. Pe- people who are dying are, and then turn out to not be dead. Um, and also, I guess, I was reading a lot of speculation that John is going to, like, warg into his spirit, is going to, like, warg into Ghost. 
and he's going to like be inside Ghost, you know, for a while. And then I guess there was some prophet. Somebody, I forget, was it Melisandre had a vision or something? Somebody had a vision about a man turning into a wolf and then into into a man again. I think it was Melisandre, uh, but I think that vision that she had was actually of Rickon. I think it was uh, Rickon on the island. Well, I guess we haven't really gotten into that yet with where Rickon is, but you know, I, I suspect that that was actually Rickon, uh, and that you know he's a warg too, so he's with his wolf. So you know, like sometimes prophecies they can be misinterpreted. So I think it was just like the connection, and I think. Where Rickon is, there are a whole lot of weirwoods, which probably like makes it more powerful. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Rickon is currently on the Isle of Skagos, or Skagos, however you pronounce it. In Feast for Crows, when Samuel Tarly is uh, sailing with Gilly and company to the Free Cities, uh, they pass the Isles of Skane and Skagos, and you learn that there are wild unicorns and cannibals on the Isle of Skagos. And then you learned that wherever it is that Davos is supposed to go, the very last sentence uh, in his last chapter is uh, he has to go to a place where men eat human flesh. So that would be Skagos. And you also learn in this fifth book that either Cotter Pike or one of his men, they sighted a broken ship off the coast of Skagos. That's probably... Rickon's ship, you know, and whatever passage he and Asha were taking, Osha, I should say, were taking. Uh, I don't know if they were trying to get there or they were trying to get north of the wall, but pretty sure they washed up there. And it's mentioned that there are a lot of weirwoods on that island. So I, that vision where Melisandre had of the, you know, the man becoming a wolf, or I think it was a child becoming a wolf, I can't be 100% sure, but she also saw something like hundreds or thousands of red eyes. I think all the red eyes are because of all the weirwoods on that island. Hey, let me ask you guys something, uh, you know, speaking of the, of this book and the, and of this book and, and also Feast for Crows, I, I personally was not a big fan of the, of the new sort of storytelling device Martin employed in those books in, in that, you know, he broke away from doing the, the close, uh, uh, point of view uh things that he had been doing all along where like you know he he throws all these like sort of one shot points of view oh, uh, like, into the chapters like it's like, like sir you know, aris Oakheart. yeah or like you know like, like the captain of the guard is like you know it, or you know like you know so you get these people throughout the various parts of the seven kingdoms and um you know and so we see them once and then we don't see their point of view again and it's like i understand why he had to do that because the story is sprawling and he needs to have he needs to be able to convey some some scenes and information that's happening in other parts of the world so that other things later on to the important characters or you know the the primary characters will will make sense um but i, I don't know i mean it's just like there's so many characters that we like sort of know intimately and that we we want to read about that um i i can't help but feeling um a little resentful of every chapter that takes me away from from them and 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 takes me on this in this other direction. Uh, I I basically agree with agree with you that you know I mean I'll, like Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons almost feel to me like a spin off series or something like I sort of think back to like I, I started off reading the series about like the Stark kids and then like, it seems like a, it seems like a whole, I mean it was like ten years ago but I mean it seems like a whole different story you know and because there's just so so little of them uh, in these two books. Um, and I do, I do miss them. I mean, I don't know. I mean, George R. R. Martin has spent 10 years, you know, messing with this, with these issues, you know, sort of wrestling with these issues. So, you know, he pr probably has thought this stuff through more than I have, but certainly my impression as a reader is that a lot of these viewpoints are not necessary. Well, I mean, I can, I can definitely understand where you guys are coming from, but at the same time, uh, this is, you know, the battle for the Iron Throne. It involves... All, it's a battle that involves all seven kingdoms. And I mean, gradually, bit by bit, you know, just the other lands of, within those, within Westeros have been getting sucked in more and more. So, you know, you were learning about Dorne in the first book, but he was like planting legitimate seeds for Dorne as early as the second book when Marcella gets shipped off to Dorne to marry their prince. Um, now, like with Sir Aris Oakhart, like he literally, he only had one chapter in the fourth book. And so, I mean, that, like, yeah, it did bother me a little bit. But then I read the fifth book. And 
it doesn't bother me as much now because we got Sir Barristan Selmy's point of view, who was another King's Guard, and I was almost left with the impression of, all right, over here we're seeing a King's Guard who's really acting how you don't think a King's Guard should, because he's doing everything for Arian, not for the good of the realm or anything else. And then you see Selmy, where, yes, he's very conflicted, and he questions himself about the decisions he's making after Danny's gone, but you always feel like he's trying to do what's best as a king's guard. So for me, that was like a nice, interesting dichotomy there. Speaking of which, thank God Danny's out of fucking Marine. It's just like, oh my God, she spent one more minute there. I would have gone crazy. That was sort of my experience reading this book is, you know, I, I've been waiting 10 years, you know, for, you know, to find out like who's cold hands and, you know, stuff like that. And then... You know, I start reading. And I'm like, this is awesome. I love like the brand chapters are awesome and stuff. That's what I'm. That's what I'm here for. And then, like about halfway, you know, and I'm really looking forward to seeing Tyrion. You know, meeting Daenerys and teaming up and stuff. And then, like halfway through the book, I I just started getting this sinking feeling. Like, oh my god, like this whole book is going to be about how Tyrion gets to Marine. You know, like he might not even he might not meet Daenerys until like near the end of this book. Maybe even like the epilogue chapter will be him meeting Daenerys or something. You know, I got the sense, like, this whole book is going to be, like, John dealing with the logistics of getting the wildlings from one side of the wall to the other, you know, when I want ice zombie attack, you know. You know, because, I mean, they're only, you know, going into this book, you're like, okay, there's three books left in this series. So I sort of expected one-third of the major events I was looking forward to and one-third of the big questions I still have that I want resolved, you know, something like one-third of them to be in this book. And almost none of them were. And, uh... I did. I did feel, yeah, especially with the Daenerys chapters and the John chapters. Like I kind of felt like I, like I was reading the same chapter over and over again. Yeah. Well, at least at least we know that in the next book that uh, you know that's not going to happen with those two characters anyway. They're they're definitely uh, often going to be doing different things uh, in the next book. I, I think a lot of the people that have you know the kind of complaints that you're voicing, uh, they probably wouldn't have been voicing a lot of those complaints. Potentially, if George was able to have made this book as long as he wanted to, just because I remember reading that, you know, they had to, like, take some of these final chapters and actually shuffle them into what's going to be the winds of winter. You know, if it was just ebooks, I guess it's a non-issue. But, you know, physical mm -hmm. books, print books, they are still a market and you have to, you know. They can only be made so large, I guess. Exactly. Because, I mean, that thing is a brick as it mm -hmm. is. Do you guys, I mean, who thinks that there's going to just be two more books in this series? Oh, no, I don't think so. It's possible, <laughs> but I mean, you know, if everything, everything is coming to a head in Marine, you know, uh, the blood is about to start flying one way or another. All the characters are almost there now. Um, so, I mean, it's very possible that things could just like, basically the shit could start hitting the fan very early in Winds of Winter. It could just be like that for two whole books, and if they're both as long as the last book, I think it's possible. I, I really I really would love it. I mean, not only because I want to see the end of the series, but, I mean, you know, because I want to see the conclusion, but, I mean, just from a sort of symmetry point of view, I really want there to be seven. Seven like, books, and, you seven know, like, kingdoms, yeah, seven gods. Yeah, you know, it just, it just makes sense. It's like, that. It, it would be, it would be like, very disappointing from a symmetrical point of view for there to be eight books <laughs> instead of seven. You know, it's like, come on, man, just, you got to cram it all into seven. How do you how do you how do you feel about the symmetry of nine, John? Because I'm predicting I'm predicting nine books. You know, it's it seemed obvious from book one that what was going to happen eventually is that the others are going to attack the wall, and Daenerys is going to bring her dragons to Westeros. And then the question for me has always been, well, what's going to happen after that? And as we get closer and closer to, yeah, and as we get closer, and, I'm like, how much is there going to be after that stuff happens, or is that? Is it all going to lead up to this stuff that's been obvious from the beginning? That seems a little weird to me. Well, I mean, if I were to guess, I think the others are going to overrun way more than the wall because, you know, we learned that the Horn of Joramin is potentially still around. So, you know, they might just bring the wall down and the, you know, Jon Snow isn't even there right now in theory. So the others might just, you know, wash over everything. And the Seven Kingdoms, for all we know, you know, they may. The others might be all the way down to the Riverlands by the time Danny shows up because, you know, the Seven Kingdoms, they're still busy tearing each other to pieces. They haven't stopped. 
every time like one battle wraps up, another one starts. So they're just leaving themselves more and more exposed. They need Danny in the worst way. They just don't know it yet. Right, but how like how many pages are going to be devoted to all of that? It's a really good question. Um, I think we'll get a fair amount. You know, because it sounds like there's going to be more and more others. Uh, they they keep their numbers keep growing as they keep adding more of these dead wildlings to their you know to their group. And once they get into the north, if that happens, you know, it's just like any other zombie movie or zombie book or story. You know, the hordes are going to keep growing. So even with dragons, you can't just wipe them out in all one fell swoop. I don't think. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, some somebody joked. Uh, you know, every time someone um asks Martin when the next book is going to come out, he kills another Stark. Um, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. Well, speaking of like killing off a Stark, I mean, one thing that sort of haunts me is that he said. I, I I've heard George say that you know how the series came to him is he had this uh, image of Bran finding the direwolves in the snow. And he, like, sort of knew the whole shape of the story then. And the story is so insanely complicated at this point. I just, I spend, spend so much time wondering, like, what, okay, what, what could you get from the finding the wolves in the snow to, like, what we have now? You know, like, what, what was the initial concept? And when, when John died, I mean, at first, you know, it didn't even occur to me that he might actually be dead. But when I thought about it, I mean, and I still don't think he is. But when I thought about it later, like, I could imagine someone thinking up the idea for a series, well... How about it's like you have these kids and they find these wolves and they seem to have a special destiny and like one becomes this awesome military commander and one becomes head of the Night's Watch and one becomes this super assassin and one becomes this tree wizard, one becomes this master, you know, Machiavellian plotter, etc. And they all try to save the world and then one by one they all die and then completely unrelated characters come in and, you know, have to have to deal with, you know, the aftermath. And uh, when that thought popped into my head, that was the only... uh, the only moment, you know, where I thought John might actually be dead, just just for a second, and I think it, I actually think that's kind of a cool a cool concept. I don't I don't think he's going to do that. Um, one reason I think is that rampaging hordes would probably descend on Santa Fe and burn his house down if he did that. But uh... <laughs> well, I do think more Stark kids will be dead before this is all said and done. It's just I think Martin's too bloody of an author to just leave them all alive come the end. Arya's going to die. I'm pretty sure about that. I mean, she's on a violent path. It's not going to end well for her. There's this line in Game of Thrones when, you know, um, it's something having to do with Jon giving needle to Arya, and he has, like, he sort of jokingly thinks to himself that, you know, when that she's going to be training all through the winter, and when the snows melt, they're going to find her body frozen, still clutching needle. And uh, I think that's a bit of foreshadowing there. Oh, okay. That's that's interesting. Interesting, yeah. But, yeah, for the longest time, I thought Arya was going to make it through to the end. And then after I reread this book the second time, it, it just, it, more than ever, I'm convinced the exact opposite. Like John said just now, she's on such a dark path, and she's giving she's being given every single opportunity to turn away. And she's not turning away, and she's not even doing it the way she's supposed to. She wants to kill people that the God of Many Faces is not going to want her to kill. And she's going to have to pay a price at some point for doing this. And we all want her to have her vengeance. And she wants her vengeance. I don't think anything's going to deter her. So it's not going to be pretty. Oh, yeah. So speaking of the speaking of the Stark children, I mean, what do you guys uh, think Brienne was up to at the end of uh, Dance with Dragons? I mean, because she's obviously misleading Jamie. If she's alive, she must have screamed sword at the end of A Feast for Crows, because I can't see how else she could have gotten out from being hanged. So she screams sword to save Pod's life, and that means since she's honorable, as best we can tell from everything we've seen, I guess she's going to, you know, bring Jamie to justice. I guess, you know, I don't know if she's going to kill him on the spot. I would, I would think she's probably bringing him back to Stoneheart and... Her merry band of men. Mm. Yeah, I just I don't want to see Jamie go down like a punk. I yeah. you know from the moment he lost his hand. <laughs> yeah. You know I think just like everyone else I and you know you started liking him a little more in Storm of Swords because she started learning a little bit more about who he is. I wanted him to relearn how to be a great fighter with his other mm-hmm. hand. I I figure he's gonna die, but I keep hoping that he's gonna die in battle as a legend with his other hand. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to like see him just 
hanging from a tree because uh, the Brotherhood Without Banners mm-hmm. is, you know, done away with him. It's Stoneheart's orders. In in this one, did anyone start feeling, I mean, some pretty horrible things happened to both Theon and Cersei. Did anyone start feeling any sympathy for them? I think uh, Theon, whatever mistakes he's made, I, I'm not saying he should be forgiven for the death of the Miller's sons, but he got punished for mm-hmm. it, make no mistake. And in the end, he did save Jane Poole. Uh, so yeah, I was feeling sympathy for Theon. Cersei, not so much yet. I just feel like she got her come up and when she had to do the walk of shame. I thought those were some very powerful chapters at the end of the book when she was, you know, getting her comeuppance and uh, and everything that happened with her. And then, and, and um, I mean, which sort of then leads up to the actual epilogue, which was like amazing. That was like a, that was like a great way to end the book. I yes, thought. the um, whole the whole book. I just kept asking myself, "Where is Varys? Yeah. Where is Varys? What about Varys? Where is Varys?" And then, boom, here's Varys. Well, and you know, one of the really interesting things that I didn't pick up when I was first reading the books, like when I first just read the first two. I didn't pick it up, and I mean, maybe, I don't remember when it was I actually did pick it up, but, you know, at some point you realize, like, Littlefinger and Varys, they're playing the Game of Thrones. I mean, they're the ones that are moving all the pieces around. Like, oh, yeah. everybody else in the book it, are the chess pieces, and they're the ones playing the game. Uh, was anyone disappointed we didn't get to see uh, the, uh, Sir, was it Sir Robert Strong in action? Not so much, just because, I mean, back in, like, Book four, like I was saying, Gregor's still alive, and Gregor's going to become part of the King's Guard mm. because uh, that's the nice twisted symmetry that Martin likes. Because Sander was part of the King's Guard for a while, and those two are like foils and mirrors to each other at the same time. And also, Aris O'Cart was dead, so you, they needed a replacement, and Cersei needs a champion because it's not going to be Jamie. So. You know, instead he gave us the walk of shame. I'm like, we'll we'll see Gregor eventually. He's going to wreak a lot of havoc. Hmm. But I was fine with it. I mean, yeah, I guess it would have been nice to, like, actually see the trial uh, and see him be the champion. But I was fine with it just because Cersei's arc for me in that book was complete after, you know, her walk of shame. Hmm. You know, we haven't even talked about Aegon. Yeah, I, I, all, I mean, people have been talking about that for years. I always thought that was completely crackpot. Then when he showed up, like, hold on, like, holy shit. Well, I mean, it was a bombshell, but I forget which red priest it was. It might have been uh, Morocco, if that's how you say it, the the big one that's a... Yeah, I think, I think it's, isn't it Makoro? Makoro, thank you, yes, Makoro. I think there's a point, I think it's him. Tyrion asks him at a point, like, what he sees, you know, in the flames or whatever. And he mentioned something about false dragons. So I'm wondering if, you know, is this another layer within the game of Varys and Illyrio that this might be a, a false dragon? Our friend Matt actually mentioned that possibility to, mm. me, possibility to me. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. But now I read it again, and, you know, Dance of Dragons. He, I think he might be a false dragon. And... I, I could drop a bombshell here if you want for a theory. Like, for who his mother is, I think it might be Septa Lamore, and I think she might be a Shara Dane. Because there's a point where Barrison Selmy is reflecting on how he used to, you know, love a Shara Dane, but she never knew. And he was thinking how she had purple eyes. And it, it, like, it almost looked like looking at Daenerys, you know, Daenerys Targaryen. So, like, well, if it's like the daughter, do- Daenerys could be his, her daughter, which is what Barrison was thinking to herself. Not only would she have purple eyes, but she would have, like, the silver hair. And Septa Lamour does not have silver hair, as we all saw. But we also saw that Griff and young Griff were both dyeing their hair blue. So who's to say that Septa Lamour was not dyeing her hair also to mm. keep things disguised? And Tyrion also noted at one point, like, who is she really? And he noticed how she had stretch marks around her stomach from having a child so maybe that's her child hmm. because, you know we know that you know we know that ashara dane threw herself from a cliff but again if you don't see a character die are they necessarily dead in this series usually not okay so so doug since you read this book twice and you read feast for crows four times like what do we actually know about ashara dane i'm a little fuzzy on that uh well she was the sister to 
Sir Arthur Dane, Sword of the Morning, who was one of the King's Guard for, you know, the Mad King. And we learn in this book that she had a stillborn child. Now, or at least that's the story that goes around, but maybe it was, you know, a uh, the false Aegon is, uh, I think it might be the case. They say that, you know, Ned returned Arthur Dane's sword to her after, you know, Arthur Dane was killed. He returned, I believe the sword's called Dawn. He returned it to her and she threw herself off the cliff, I believe, in grief and sorrow, whatever. It's not like we know that much. People say that, you know, you know, within the world, they say maybe, you know, she and maybe she's Jon Snow's mother, some people think, although I don't. Uh, some people in that world think that they, you know, loved each other, but that never happened. Wait, who 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 loved each other? Some people think that, you know, Ashara Dane and Ned Stark loved each other within that world. Yeah. But, you know, there, there's a lot there's a lot we don't know. And even like, I think it was in the first book. Um, could have been the second or third, though. There, Catelyn has a memory about mentioning a Shara Dane or something once to Ned, and Ned said, you know, don't ever mention her to me again or something like that. So, you know, it's not something Ned really wants to talk about. I mean, I saw there was a lot of discussion online about, I didn't follow it that closely, but it was about, you know, there's in one of Barristan Selmy's chapters, he thinks that, quote unquote, Stark dishonored a Shara Dane. And the people were like, well, is that Ned Stark? Is it maybe Brandon Stark? In that memory that I was just talking about with uh, the purple eyes of Ashara Dane, the, the interesting thing is earlier in that book, he was like defending Ned Stark to Dany, saying, you know, he was an, he's an honorable man, you know. Uh, but when he's having that memory later, he doesn't think to himself, Ned Stark dishonored her. He thinks to himself, Stark dishonored her. You know, you only know Stark. So, you know, Ned's a possibility, and then they make it, like, Brandon's a possibility, especially after you find out, like, you know, about his uh, relationship with Lady Barbary. It sounds like, you know, he was just interested in, you know, basically having sex with a lot of women. And then another thought occurred to me, you know, what if it was Benjen Stark, and that's why he had to take the ah. black? You know, we all just assume that Benjen Stark took the black because that's the honorable thing to do, but did anyone ever say outright... Benjamin Stark took the black because he found that to be a, a lifetime of honorable, you know, service to the realm. Maybe that's like a big Stark family secret because we are starting to learn in book five that the Stark family history is not as perfect as we'd all like to believe. I, did you, did you notice the thing about the pies when they're at? I think it's Winterfell. Uh, you know, the Dreadfort men and everyone else, and Lord Manderley brings all that food, and there are three mm -hmm. huge pork pies. Those pork pies are the missing phrase. Huh. And that's why when uh, he's leaving at the end of the night and he's all drunk, he's muttering about the rat cook, who was referenced in book three when Bran is in the night fort and, like, the rat cook served up meals of, I think, his own children. Or just, he served up meals of his family to someone and it angered the gods. And he got, like, he was a human and he got changed into the rat cook. So... That was a reference to that to kind of help, you know, help hint this is what's really going on with those pork pies. And that's why Manderly was taking such pleasure in stuffing his face with <laughs> th that food in particular. So do you, so you, do you have any idea how this story is going to end? I did predict a while before this book that Bran's going to go off with the Children of the Forest. I think I'm still right, but it's going to be a little bit more of a bittersweet ending than I thought. Um, I think if there's one Stark that's going to live... I think it's going to be Rickon, just because uh, they say there must always be a Stark in Winterfell. Um, Ari wouldn't want to be the Lady of Winterfell. I don't think Sansa deserves it. Jon Stark had his chance, and he denied it. Rob, you know that his wife was, you know, poisoned by his mother, like, secretly to keep her from ever conceiving children. So Rob's not going to have any heirs through, you know, his wife Jane. You need someone to carry on the Stark line, so I think it's going to be Rickon. I think Tyrion's going to be the Lord of Casterly Rock just because he kind of wants it and, you know, he is entitled to it. And through the whole series, he's always been getting trod upon, basically, and no one cares about his rights. So it might be, you know, fitting that he finally gets something that he deserves because 
He's far from a perfect person, but, you know, he does have a moral compass of sorts. He does, yes, he also does the bowl of brown where he puts a singer in the stew, so he's not perfect, but, um, I think, I think Danny, Danny's a big question mark in my mind. I mean, is she going to be on the throne come the end? Because if she's on the throne, that means that, you know, she needs to be able to conceive to carry on the line. And that seems like it might be possible based on what's happening in her last chapter. But that whole prophecy that the crone gave her, the Mimiri Mazdur, was about when she'll see Cal Drogo again. So if all these things are coming to pass, does that mean that she's going to, like, see Cal Drogo as, like, she's dying? You know, now she's going to she's gonna see his spirit, and she's going to ride with the great Kalisar in the sky? What did you guys make of that whole prophecy in, uh, with Dany, by the way? Uh, you know, like when the sun ri- when the sun rises in the west and sets in the east, and when mountains blow about like leaves in the wind, and when your womb quickens again, only then will you you know see Cal Drogo. I saw speculation online. I I don't know how much I how how much I think really anything really think that that's a prophecy or or whatever. But I mean, people were saying, well, you could interpret it as you know, Doran is rising. You know, Doran is is in the west, and they're um. Sigil is the sun, and so they're rising in the west, and then but then their scion, um, uh, Quentin just died in the east, um, and that like the you know in um, Marine there are these pyramids, and the dragons are like tearing the shit out of them, and now they're like all like smoking ruins, and so that's like mountains blowing like blowing in the wind. I heard the the one about the pyramids, but the first thing that occurred to me actually for mountains blowing about in the wind was Gregor Clegane. He's the mountain, oh, yeah. and he's just, like, being passed around like a leaf in the wind. Hmm. So there's, you know, and a little bit more of a different kind of metaphor of the mountain blowing or blowing in the wind, you know? he First he was serving someone, then he was under control of Quiburn, and now, uh, you know, he's serving Cersei through the control of Quiburn, so he's like a puppet on strings, so... Uh, that sounds really reaching to me. Does, isn't, doesn't she say when mountains blow in the wind? I, I think so. So, yeah, I mean, I wasn't sure, but I'm just saying that was the first thing that occurred to me. The pyramids probably are more likely. But also, all that bleeding makes me think that, you know, her womb is in working order again. She she was having profuse bleeding. So, you know, it seems like you, it seems like a lot of that, of what uh, Miri Mazdur was coming to pass and was being pointed out to us there. Uh, what do you guys think about the Others and the Red God and the god of death and the drowned god and all that stuff. Oh, like which ones are real and which ones are... Yeah, well, yeah, which ones are real and or what is going to happen with them later in the story? You know, the okay, so you have, like, the Lord of Light, but I think the Lord of Light, you can make an argument, is the same thing as the Seven because it's been said more than once that, you know, the Seven are just different aspects, different faces of the same god. So that could still be, they could all be the same aspect of the Lord of Light, and that could also have an umbrella to include the many-faced God. The many-faced God could be all these faces. So I think those can all arguably be the same God. Dave, you pointed out to me that you think the Drowned God is probably a sham, and, you know, the whole thing with, like, uh, breathing life back into them, that's just, you know, CPR. The only thing the only thing with the Drowned God is that Patchface seems to have actually been... You know, he's had some experience that has, seems to have actually given him some sort of gift of prophecy. Maybe. And, and I did notice in the second book, I mean, the latest book, that Melisandre is scared of Patchface. I think if she dies, I think it might be because of Patchface. That's the only time I've seen Melisandre scared of anything. There's a moment where she is scared of Patchface. So, yeah, maybe maybe the Drowned God isn't, you know, uh, complete BS because I did forget about Patchface. I mean, you know, back in uh, back in episode 22 when we interviewed George R. R. Martin, you know, we had our discussion about this series afterward, and I said that there's a line in Armageddon Rag uh, that I felt like was a s- sort of a thematic spoiler for the series. That's an- another one of his uh, George's novels, or an earlier novel. And uh, and so the line is, it goes something like, um, at Armageddon, two armies will meet upon a field of battle, both believing that they're fighting for the side of good. And they will both be wrong. I've always thought that 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 that's what's going on here is that you have the god of fire and the god of ice, and you know, in a classic epic fantasy, it would be a battle of good versus evil. And in this story, it's actually a battle of evil versus evil. 
uh, in terms of the supernatural powers involved. It's sort of more of a Lovecraftian kind of thing. And then there's sort of the green magic, you know, of the children of the forest that represents sort of the healthy balance between, you know, the fire on one side and the ice on the other side. You know, I was, you know, I, I had avoided reading anything online uh, for, for years because I was behind in the series and I didn't want to see any spoilers. But once I finished the fifth book, I, you know, I went and I, I did some reading on the Westeros forums and whatnot. Um, and, and, and I came across uh, something that was sort of, a, you know, this, I guess it's a prevailing theory uh, about the series, but the idea that uh, Song of Ice and Fire actually refers to Danny and John, that John is, you know, the ice and Danny's the fire and, 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 you know, th I mean, there's a lot of complicated uh, reasonings behind uh, why they think this, uh, uh, largely because of, like, some theories about John's parentage. But, um, you know, given that John did just appear to die, and the fact that he may be now released from his vows um, uh, from the Watch, it, it sort of opens up that to a uh, possibility that that is what's happening here, that, um, you know, it, it is going to be this, you know, Song of Ice and Fire, meaning John, and this is John and Danny's story now. You know, well, knowing George, so, that whole title is probably multi-layered. Yeah, sure. I mean, the a, a, a theory I heard one time that I thought was really interesting was that you know, there's this story about when Azor Ahai some, somehow Azor Ahai had to stab this woman that he loved in the heart with a sword to make it flame to sort of create Lightbringer. And so I heard a theory that either John or Danny is Azor Ahai reborn, and one of them is going to have to have to stab the other one, whom they've fallen in, fallen in love with, to create the flaming sword. Oh, that's that's a good theory, because it's been pointed out to us again and again that Stannis' Lightbringer is not the real deal. So you got to assume if the Azor Ahai is going to come on the scene at some point, we are going to see the real Lightbringer sooner or later. So I mean, as far as as far as the gods go, you think you think that some of them are definitely actually real. I think I think there may be. I think maybe Rolor is real, and the Great Other is real. Um, the Seven, I think, are fake. Uh, the Drowned God is made probably fake. Uh, or the other thing is that maybe there's like magic, and people think that there are gods, but there actually aren't, or we'll never know. That's what I tend you know. to think that, is that that there's that there's some sort of magic in the world and and people ascribe it to gods, but um, but the, but that the gods that they actually think that they think are real are actually imaginary, just because of how sort of rational a place that world seems. You know, the the, the idea that gods are actually doing anything to influence the world and pulling the strings seems to sort of counterintuitive to to the rest of the series to me. Well, if we never learn, though, I mean, I'm kind of fine with that. We better find out more of the more about the others than we currently know, though. I'm going to be very upset if the series ends <laughs> with us knowing no more about the others than we currently do. We better find out who Cold Hands is before the series is over. It hasn't been said. I'm still operating under the assumption that Cold Hands is Benjamin Stark, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been outright said. Mm -hmm. That seems like the easiest answer. So, like, I kind of wonder if if that's like a, a reason to not think that that's the case. Right, but if it's not. Benjamin Stark, then what happened to Benjamin Stark, right. and what's he going to do in the story? Right. You know, I know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think I almost think that that's a red herring that 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 Bran's going to stumble across Benjamin Stark's body at some point, uh, and then and then the reader can be like, wait, wait, so wait, who's who's Cold Hands then? Yeah. yeah. And then and then I don't know, but um, but this, no, I mean, yeah, that does it would make sense if it was Benjamin. This but, is the thing Martin does; he makes you second guess yourself even yeah. when you come to logical conclusions. Yeah. But speaking of Bran, actually, that was one of my disappointments with Dance with Dragons is that, um, I mean, the chapters were all good, but they were fantastic. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, the last half of the book or so, no more Bran. It's like it was all early on in the book, and then and then we didn't see Bran for, you know, a long time. Yeah, but, like, the where it stopped, the, a change has come to Bran now. The transformation is beginning in a major way. So I thought it, I was okay with that stopping point. The stopping point that actually drove me really crazy was Davos. I wanted mm -hmm. one more Davos chapter at least. Just, you know, I wanted to, like, see him get to Skagos, if I'm right. That's where Bran it, Br Rickon is. Mm -hmm. And he didn't. So that that's the one that killed me, personally. That last, I think it was, I think it was the last Bran chapter, right, where he sort of is looking back through time, through the weirwood trees. That was an amazing, that was amazing uh, writing right there. I'm pretty sure that one of the characters he sees, well, two of the characters I think are Lyanna and Ned Stark or one of the other Stark boys, like when they're children. But I'm also pretty sure that one of the other characters Bran is seeing is Sir Duncan the Tall, 
who mm-hmm. a lot of our readers, a lot of the readers will know George is writing stories about Sir Duncan Tall, Sir Duncan the Tall and his squire Egg in this world that take place a hundred years beforehand. So George, he constantly weaves those stories into, you know, the main novel. Like, for example, uh, the Three-Eyed Crow is actually a character you've seen in the Duncan Egg stories. You know, you see him a hundred years earlier, so it's really interesting to bring him back all of a sudden in that manner. Hey, do you guys have any theories on who the other dragon riders are going to be? Well, one one has to be Tyrion, especially if he's a secret Targaryen. I, I've oh, I hadn't heard that one. That Tyrion's secretly a Targaryen. Uh yeah. That, actually, our friend Matt mentioned that to me too. That it's possible that uh, the Mad King might have fathered Tyrion on the Lady Joanna, who was Lord Tywin's wife, because there's this reference that uh, in the latest book about, you know, the Mad King having an attraction to Lady Joanna. Mm-hmm. So it would, like, kind of explain the mismatched eyes and just, like, maybe the dragon and the lion were never meant to mate, mm-hmm. and this is the result. It would explain more why uh, his why Tyrion's father hated him so much. I mean, even beyond the fact that he's a dwarf, you know? You know, it would explain that Tyrion's fascination with dragons since the first book, mm-hmm. because that fascination has not went away. I'm also wondering, though, if at some point Bran is going to use his skin-changing abilities to slip inside the skins of one of the dragons. Hmm. Because there's still that dragon horn out there, and at some point you have to assume, kind of like, you know, uh, the gun on the wall, the gun has to go off. You have to assume at some point this dragon horn is going to bind the dragons. So how do you unbind the dragons? Maybe Bran can use his skin-changing abilities to unbind one of the dragons, and he is the winged wolf. So he is going to fly at some point, and he's already done it through, a, you know, the ravens. But, you know, I think they're probably going to take it a step further, and you'll see him, like, in the skin of a dragon flying around. And I always thought John was going to be... John is also a secret Targaryen, and he's uh, he was going to be number three. Uh, a friend of mine pointed out to me that, like, the person who's probably going to be able to give us the most revelations on who John is, is probably Howlin' Reed. He's like the last person that was left from that battle when Ned and his companions fought, you know, the remains of the Kingsguard at that broken tower and that awesome memory Ned has in the first book. And we haven't seen Howlin' Reed. We've only seen this kid. So you got to assume at some point Howlin' Reed is going to come on the scene and he probably knows what the deal is with Liana and the secret, because someone someone has to know the secret, you know? So Who is it? And it's probably Howlin' Reed, so I'm looking forward to seeing him at some point. Oh, I have a... As long as we're talking about, like, these big theories, I'll share a big theory I have with you guys that goes all the way back to book one. Like, the real guy that's responsible for Ned Stark's death. Yes, Joff ordered the sword to, you know, chop off his head, so, yes, he ordered it, but the man pulling the strings for that whole scenario, I'm convinced it was Peter Baelish. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, that would make sense. Because, well, first of all, if... He was in the, love with Catelyn. He was in love with Catelyn, and if the Starks and the Lannisters made peace, think about how many of Peter Baelish's plans would have come mm-hmm. completely undone if that one thing happened. So he had to do whatever necessary whatever was necessary in order to ensure that didn't happen. And, you know, I was kind of thinking this all along as I was doing my last reread in anticipation of the fifth book. And it was, like, making more and more sense. And then I saw episode nine of the HBO series, uh, Baylor, that's the one where Ned uh, gets his head taken and he dies. And there was something that happened in the series that left me 100% convinced that, oh, my God, I'm right. If you watch that scene where Ned is, you know, double-crossed and he gets decapitated, about 20, 15 to 20 seconds beforehand, there is a moment where it's off to the bottom left of the screen. You see Peter Baelish and Varys. And Varys, while there's chaos going on everywhere, people are screaming, yelling, Varys is just looking at Peter Baelish, glaring at him, while everyone else is, like, you know, trying to either kill Ned or screaming for his head or trying to stop this. Varys is just glaring at Peter Baelish with, like, intense hatred. It's, oh, and it's just, it's screaming. 
you did this. You're responsible for this happening right now. But it's off to the bottom left of the screen. So while it's like clear as day, no one's paying attention to the bottom left of the screen. I just happened to like glimpse it. And then like I always watch like every episode at least twice. So the second time I watched it, I paid attention for it. And I think they put that in there because Peter Baelish is, and as you said, John, Peter Baelish and Varys, they're the two guys that are really playing the Game of Thrones. I think this is one more point that illustrates that. And I think you're going to find out in one of these final books that Peter Baelish is the reason Ned is dead. Um, all right. I just wanted to, just maybe to wrap things up, I, you know, uh, I was reading the message board years ago and, and there was a thread and it said, you know, what do you think the last line of Song of Ice and Fire is going to be? And the one that somebody posted that I liked the best, it, it, it sort of goes like, uh, you know, Bran is, was sitting in the grass beside the tree and all around him the, the snows were melting. And, uh, you know, and I don't know, maybe there's some other characters there too. And it's like, uh, you know, over over the hill, hill ahead of them, he saw like a gray wolf come bounding over the hill. And he sort of called out in joy and, and yelled out, Summer is coming. Yeah, that's cute. Uh, for me, if I were to like guess like the last possible thing... I know when Danny goes to the House of Warlocks, there's a point where she sees a flower growing from an ice wall. So that could be like an actual flower that's growing from the wall because the winter is over. Hmm. I have no theories about the last line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. Uh, thanks again to Lev Grossman and Doug Cohen for joining us on the show. Uh, if you're enjoying the show and you'd like to help us spread the word, please give us a review or rating in iTunes. We're hoping to get up to 100 ratings by the end of the year, and we're up to 93. So we just need seven more people to open up iTunes and type Geek's Guide into the search bar and click on the little click to write icon. And we've had about 20 people do that in just the past month. So thanks to everyone who took the time to do that. If you'd like to respond to anything you heard on the show today, you can visit our website at geeksguideshow.com and find the post for episode 48 with Lev Grossman and click on the link there, and it'll take you to io9.com where you can post comments. So looking forward to hearing from everyone, and thanks for listening. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of io9. For this episode's show notes, to subscribe to this podcast, or for more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarrcurtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by Slipgate 9 Entertainment. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.